This is the ancestral land of the first people, the Kumeyaay. Portions of this video were filmed in the neighboring lands of the Payom Kuichum and the Kupeño people. Do you notice a pattern here? Have you ever wondered why San Diego County seems to evoke such a strong Spanish influence? From the design of public buildings and homes to the names of our towns and roads? Many assume that this is a result of cultural fusion due to our proximity to the U.S.-Mexico border, or San Diego's past as a Spanish colony. Surprisingly, it isn't. While San Diego was a Spanish colony from 1769 until 1821, and a part of Mexico from 1821 to 1847, life during these periods would have looked incredibly different from the way it appears in our collective social memory. Depictions of the Spanish and Mexican historical periods during the early 20th century often blended the two distinct periods into one, erasing the culture of local indigenous peoples as well as Mexicans of indigenous heritage, creating a pervasive social memory that placed emphasis on a Spanish fantasy past. First termed by Carrie McWilliams in 1946 as Spanish fantasy heritage, this social and cultural phenomena came into play in Southern California from 1910 until the early 1940s, peaking in the 1920s. In its most basic form, it is the intentional recasting of the eras of Spanish mission colonies and Mexican rancho settlements as an idyllic golden age upon which Anglo settlers of Southern California could look back upon with nostalgia in order to obscure their contemporary struggles with the racial politics of the region including the active genocide of indigenous peoples and often violent discrimination against Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. As scholar Phoebe Kropp explains, many observers continue to wonder how Anglos could simultaneously celebrate the Spanish past and denigrate the Mexican present without collapsing under the weight of their own contradictions. Bending the region's social memory to fit their needs, these Anglo settlers embarked on a quest to recreate what they viewed as the true past of Southern California. As historian Didier Delizer explains, social memory is always emergent because of the changing present. The very nature of social memory often alters the way the past is remembered, thus in effect making the past itself appear to change. Not reliant strictly on factual events of the past, social memory relies instead most strongly on the social contexts of the present. San Diego's social memories were actually created by politicians, business investors, and other members of the Anglo elite in the early 20th century America in an effort to cater to what the average white American tourist or potential property owner would want out of a vacation destination or new residence. With the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898 and the resulting collapse of Spain's colonial empire, American prejudices against Spain gave way to a period of obsession with colonial Spain. At the same time, newly constructed railroads were connecting Southern California to the east, providing westward passengers a comfortable cross-country journey for the first time. The defunct Spanish missions up and down the California coast, on the verge of crumbling, were reimagined as attractive tourist destinations of romanticized nostalgia, with imagery of benevolent padres, large gardens full of imported plants, and racial harmony. The descendants of the landholding elite of the Spanish and Mexican periods, often referred to as the Californios, suddenly had a white American audience eager to hear about their contributions to California history, regardless of how fictionalized it may have been. From the popularity of Helen Hunt Jackson's wildly successful novel, Ramona, to the Spanish colonial revival architecture in Balboa Park, built for the 1915 Panama Exposition, rosy depictions of the Spanish colonial period quickly became Southern California's regional signature. From postcards and movies to place names and architecture, there was no shortage of imagery emphasizing the European influence on San Diego, actively erasing the violent history of colonization, as well as the contributions of the first peoples of San Diego County and the people of mixed, or largely non-European, heritage from Mexico. In addition, racist policies such as redlining and restrictive housing covenants prevented many Native American, Mexican, and Mexican Americans from living in the areas where land was desirable. 
The romanticization of the Spanish fantasy past also serves to mask the exploitation of the labor of Mexicans and Mexican Americans, especially those who had a hand in building important infrastructure that made the fantasy possible. When combined with aggressive advertising campaigns and newspaper articles promoting San Diego's fertile soil and wide open coastal living, these factors had an incredible draw, bringing wealthy investors, tourists seeking fresh air, and anyone else who could afford to leave the crowded cities of the East. The novel Ramona was partially responsible for the preservation of Old Town San Diego. Helen Hunt Jackson published her novel in 1884, attempting to shine light on the ongoing oppression of indigenous people in Southern California. With her fictional story of Ramona, a woman of half-white, half-indigenous parentage, and her lover, Alessandro, the son of a Chimawavy leader. However, what audiences primarily took away from Jackson's novel was an idealistic view of the Rancho period. When combined with all the common literary tropes for women's romance novels in the 19th century, the story's popularity created a craze for all things Ramona. La Casa de Estudio Located in the center of Old Town San Diego State Historic Park, became a popular tourist destination due to its rumored connection to the novel. Sensing an opportunity, John D. Spreckles of the Spreckles Sugar Fortune decided to capitalize on the success of the novel and purchase the crumbling adobe home. With the help of architect Hazelwood Waterman, Spreckles helped finance the restoration of the supposed marriage place of the fictional Alessandro and Ramona disregarding the building's actual origins as the Estudio family home during the Spanish and later Mexican periods. While the house was restored closely following the original layout of the building, the influence of Waterman's picturesque view of the Spanish colonial past was undeniable. Rather than restore it to a high degree of historical accuracy, she created a stage for acting out a past that had never occurred. What would have once been a dry patch of dirt save for a practical vegetable garden, was transformed into a garden overflowing with decorative exotic plants and a wishing well. Ramona's marriage place became such a popular tourist destination for marriages and vacations that, in 1940, a reported 1,632 people visited in one day. Throughout the county, real estate developers, railway promoters, and self-appointed spokespeople of the California elite were eager to portray San Diego as an undisturbed piece of tranquility amidst the turmoil of inner city life. For upper and middle class white Americans in the early 20th century, the inner city was a dreaded place, full of recent immigrants, crowded conditions, disease, and extreme poverty. Here in San Diego, where the sun supposedly never set on the Spanish days of yore, thousands of white immigrants heeded the call to buy their own little piece of history. Notice, nowhere in this image is there room for the recognition of atrocities committed against the first peoples of San Diego at the hands of the colonial powers that violently enslaved them. When promotional materials and booklets did mention the first people, they were described with dehumanizing and infantilizing language, implying that their implicit value to the white Americans of San Diego was their connection to Spanish colonialism. As one promotional brochure reads, Indians are either the children of the old missions or their descendants, or peons of the old Spanish residents, and outside of town are the most peaceable, harmless creatures in the world. This romanticization of a period in time which, in reality, was marked by violent displacement and acts of both cultural and physical genocide of First Peoples is ingrained in many of our cultural institutions to the present day. From the commemorative El Camino Real bells that can be seen up and down the coast, to the manipulation of the names of landmarks and communities taken from Kumeyaay and Luiseño languages and Hispanicized, it is clear that the social memory of San Diego has been meticulously crafted to portray a whitewashed image. The origins of the route now commonly known as El Camino Real are ancient, and have connected the First Peoples and their kin for thousands of years prior to European invasion. Along the road are hundreds of bells commemorating the path that Juanipero Serra and other missionaries followed as they established missions, presidios, and pueblos up and down the coast of California. 
These bells, eventually totaling 450, were erected as monuments during the early 20th century by social clubs of wealthy white women, such as the Daughters of the Golden West and the California Federation of Women's Clubs. Places such as the site of the fictitious Sarah Palm, where the myth of Juanipero Sarah supposedly planting the first imported palm tree in San Diego is memorialized, received a plaque and National Historic Landmark status due to the activism of similar organizations. In addition, the ceremonies held for the commemoration of all these monuments helped to promote the idea that Spanish colonists were benevolent teachers who brought civilization to California. These monuments and the idea of a Spanish fantasy past ignore the realities of colonialism for the first people of California. In recent years, indigenous people have expressed cultural resistance in new ways, including the Walk for the Ancestors organization, which held a 2016 walk of commemoration along the entire length of the road now known as the El Camino Real, tying red ribbons on the bells to mark the suffering that their ancestors endured at the hands of the mission system. This recognition of mass starvation, rampant disease, and sexual abuse stands in stark contrast with the way many residents of Southern California were educated about the missions. Despite these acts of historical and cultural revisionism and erasure, the traditions and contributions of the First Peoples endure to this day. The I-8 freeway, which connects to the old Highway 80, follows the path that the First People have been following for thousands of years to trade and travel between the desert and the coast. Today, this portion of the highway is officially designated as the Kumeyaay Highway, in commemoration of the historical and cultural significance of this road. Just as many of the roads we travel now were routes commonly used by the First Peoples, the names of many places in San Diego County originate from the first languages spoken in this land. It's important to remember that the names of these places have their roots in the languages of the first people who have always called this land their home. The renaming of landmarks in California was, as William J. Bauer puts it, part of a discovery ritual by which settlers colonized indigenous land and economics. Renaming or changing the name of a location affirms the dominant culture's claim on a place. In San Diego County, as Kumeyaay historian Michael Misquish Connolly points out, the names of many places and natural landmarks originate in the Kumeyaay language, but were Hispanicized during the American period beginning in 1846 to appeal to tourists who might be otherwise intimidated by stopping at a location in what many considered to still be the Wild West. Hakum became Hakumba, Hamasha became Hamacha, Hawaii became Poway, and Mat Lahoy became La Jolla. It is a common misconception that La Jolla means the gem in Spanish, when in reality, Mat Lahoy refers to the many caves and holes along the cliffs. From the mission diorama kits that fourth grade students across California complete every year, to historically misattributed place names, the rosy picture painted of California's past is often inaccurate. San Diego's Spanish period was emphasized in the building of the city and county we know today, capitalizing on the successful marketing of the fabricated Spanish fantasy past of California. Thank you for watching. This video was created as part of the Relevancy in History Project, an innovative public humanities initiative that seeks to highlight the underrepresented histories and voices of California's diverse communities in order to advance and integrate equity, inclusion, and social justice practices within the interpretive landscape of California State Parks. For more resources and information, please visit our website.